I am Brigitte Pitarakis, researcher at the CNRS in Paris. My main area of research is Byzantine metalwork. I am also involved in iconography, historiography of Byzantine studies. It's a great honor and pleasure to introduce Elena Beck, professor at the Department of History of Art and Architecture at DePaul University in Chicago. Elena is a member of the editorial board of Dumbarton Oaks Papers, the Journal of Russian Icons and Eastern European Visual Culture and Byzantium book series. Elena explores cross-cultural intellectual exchange in the Mediterranean and multiple forms of engagement uh, with Byzantine legacy. Her first book, Imagining the Byzantine Past, the Perception of History in the Manuscript of Skilitzes and Manassas, University Press in 2015 stems from her doctoral dissertation submitted at the History of Art Department at Yale University in 2003. The subject of her inquiry there was two lavishly illustrated manuscripts of Byzantine chronicles. Her interest in the function and meaning of images allowed her to describe a process of reimagination of Byzantine history made to suit the interests of commissioners from outside the Byzantine Empire. The iconography of manuscripts engaged her on a challenging inquiry on the ideological and artistic impact of Constantinople in the collective imagination of neighboring cultures in different periods of time and open her new horizons of research in the areas of historiography and reception of Byzantium. In exploring the bridges between history writing and imagination, she got challenged by questions of agency and agentivity uh, developed in the field of anthropology for an innovative look onto the cultural biography of objects. She has two edited volumes in press on the afterlife of Byzantine monuments and the legend of Troy in Middle Ages. Her new book is the first interdisciplinary study devoted to a cross-culturally significant monument in the Mediterranean world the Bronze Horseman of Justinian in Constantinople, published by Cambridge University Press and will be released at the end of May this year. The Bronze Horseman of Justinian, a colossal statue, once stood atop a high column in Augustean Square outside Hagia Sophia. A landmark of Constantinople, the monument continued to hold a place in the collective imagination of the city long after the removal, its removal by Mehmed the Conqueror and subsequent demolition. Celebrated as one of the wonders of Constantinople in the 10th century, the Bronze Horseman nourished legends, prophecies, and artistic imaginations. Imbued with great ideological significance, the monument was believed to possess talismanic powers. It would go on to play a prominent role in Turkish historiography. Such a particular monument merits an engaging inquiry. And that is exactly what Elena Berg has achieved in exploring an extraordinary number and diversity of sources, both textual and visual related to the statue. The two main approaches of Beck's scholarship are to reveal the underlying origins of images and their ideological underpinnings. In doing so, across the 17 chapters of the work here, she presents a new reading of Byzantine history with the Bronze Horseman as its representative figure. The monument provides the perfect medium 
for the author to explore the connections and roles of historical truth, subjectivity, and imagination in the story of Constantinople. Back moves from the extraordinary visual impact of the monument positioned next to the towering dome of Hagia Sophia to the statue's cultural appropriation in the Slavic world in early Islamic mystic trends or Renaissance Italy. In tracing the statues and fate of the bronze horsemen, Beck takes the reader on a journey from the power of imperial ideology in Byzantium in part evident in the workmanship and material of the statue to the fascination Byzantium exercised long after the fall of the empire. Now, I would like to give the floor to Elena Beck. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Brigitte. This was far too generous and I am glowing if you can see it from here, but thank you very much. It's very kind of you. Um, so thank you for the introduction uh, very much. Uh, thank you to Petros for organizing this event and of course for having the ever-present and vigilant tech support of Nasser, whose help I hope I don't have to use when trying to share the screen. So I'm going to talk about the images and the um, narrative uh, very briefly. Let's see. Let's see, let's see. Uh, I think you can see, can, can, can you see the screen now? Yes. yes. Perfect. Uh, not the messy desktop. All right, Very good. so um, I'm going to make uh, three points um, related to the book. And uh, this is just by way of a backdrop. This is one of my very favorite images from the book, but this helps to think through the visual impact of the monument. And you can see, of course, the handsome golden horseman on the column right here. So I'm making um, not a terribly modest claim, but nonetheless, that this was the most cross-culturally significant sculptural monument of the medieval Mediterranean. And I will explain why. So this is one point. The second point, that it's afterlives after the monument was removed and destroyed, as Brigitte mentioned, its afterlives are as interesting and as important as its physical life. And the third point is that its valuation for the Byzantine beholders was vastly greater than for the Byzantinists thus far. And I hope that the Byzantinists will take another look at the skyline of Constantinople and think differently about the monuments and the dialogue of monuments. So uh, right now we're looking at the 15th century Italian illustration, uh, which summarizes Constantinople. And there are a lot of things to talk about this image, but. I will make some uh, broad points as this image um, evokes um, mentality, evokes approach, and evokes an understanding of representation of the city and hierarchies of values. So the monument we see here is the kind that towered over Constantinople and that towered over imagination of a lot of the beholders. This is also a monument which uh, during its 900 year physical existence as a monument of Justinian. Um, it had an earlier phase, but as a monument of Justinian 900 year existence, uh, it assumed new identities several times. And that's a very interesting facet of its biography. It's a monument that spawned conflicting narratives. And it's also a monument, as you can see in this image, that acquired international acclaim. This is also a monument, although it was a stationary colossal monument, it has enormous discursive range. So roughly 3000 kilometers to the west, about 2000 kilometers to the north, and about 2000 kilometers to the east. This is also a monument which had a great impact in visual culture, arguably among the most extensive in the Mediterranean. And I have to say, as a side note, the intellectual journey this monument took me on uh, from the um, Florentine wedding chests 
two crusader period romances has been really, really enjoyable. And in the process, I met some extraordinary scholars of whom I got to talk about apocalyptic narratives and things like this. It has been a lot of fun. So the other point that I would like to make also is that the majesty of Hagia Sophia is incomplete without restoring the horsemen to the skyline of Constantinople. They were meant to be a pair. And in the medieval period and the early Renaissance period, as we can see here, they were understood often enough as a pair. And so the pairing of the two is very important. So this is to the uh, first point of the broad claims about the power of the monument and its role. Now, if we consider briefly the afterlives, and uh, uh, Brigitte referred to them. So I, I will only speak here about two variants of afterlives, not three. I'm leaving uh, Western cultural imagination, the Renaissance outside of the presentation here, but it's in the chapters. And the book is divided about half and half, half Byzantine chapters and half reception of the monument elsewhere. So on the screen now you're looking at, um, on the right is an illustration from an Ottoman manuscript, late 16th century. And on the left, you're looking at the Russian icon, um, roughly mid 16th century. Uh, both produced well over a hundred years after the monument is removed from the column and several decades after the column itself disappears. Uh, the column was removed in about 1520. And here you can see very different approaches to the memories of Byzantium. And this is another interesting issue. When the monument is destroyed, it does not, its, its legacy does not die, if you will. It becomes, it has a new life in the intellectual space between real and imagined. And depending on how different cultures and different political actors looked upon Byzantium and looked upon Constantinople, they placed and they thought about the monument in different ways. So in the Ottoman imagination, uh, we see the horseman, a horseman, but with an orb, uh, so a golden ball, ball um, association with the red apple legend of the Ottoman tradition is clearly also present here. We see the monuments of the Hippodrome very clearly articulated and relative height in the imagination is also very nice, as you can see here for scale. And of course, uh, the monument stands next to Hagia Sophia, which now it dwarfs pretty much completely. So in terms of hierarchies of scales, it, it's a fascinating example. On the left, on the Russian icon, you can see the horseman very, very high up. And uh, the horseman is higher than Jesus. And it, the horseman rivals the dome of a church. So here we also have an interesting thing going on. But in the Ottoman imagination, it's a monument that inhabits apocalyptic landscape. Uh, it's a curious artifact. It, it's a historical marvel. It's a monument to futility also. And this is the futility, if you will, the legacy of Byzantium because the monument is inscribed, the apple that the horseman grasped the world and possessed it until at death he could no longer hold it. And the apple part or the orb, uh, I'll return very quickly in just a second. So the horseman is an inconvenient past, it's a powerful past, and it's a dangerous past. And it's an ever-present past in this illustration. In the Russian icon, it's a very different valuation. It's about totality of triumphal orthodoxy. We're looking at the visionary Constantinople and the visionary representation of orthodoxy that embraces the past from the Russian perspective, the past that was the Byzantine Empire, the present of orthodoxy, and the setting of Constantinople, which is both real and imagined. So here, it's a rev referential artifact which stands for imperial city. And of course, an imperial city of orthodox imagination is very different from an uh, imperial city of the Ottoman imagination. So we see this competitive uh, angle. Now, finally, in the West, and the images I'm not showing, in the Western uh, cultural imagination, let's say, it, uh, broadly speaking, Italy, 
Italy right now. It's an allegory and a metaphor. It is taken uh, away, quite literally, the monument from Constantinople, and it can be transplanted into key cities of Western historical imagination, Jerusalem, Rome, and Athens. And it is placed in these cities at key cultural, narrative, historical, civilizational pivotal points. And so the monument and the power of this monument in as the symbol, imperial symbol and talisman of Constantinople in a way continues on after it's the end of its life. But the discourse is quite different depending on the relationship to Constantinople. Now, the final point about the value of this monument and the understanding of this monument in uh, to the Byzantine beholders. On the right, you're looking at the Byzantine image, and then on the left, you, have, you see something far, very far from Byzantium. Two points here, and that is one is restorations of this monument are a testament to its valuation and its power in the lives of the residents of Constantinople and the emperors. So on the right, you're looking at the coin of Theophilus. And in particular here, I would point uh, to his quite spectacular plumed headdress, which I argue is the two for the headdress of Justinian's horsemen, which fell down in 839-40, uh, depending uh, how the logography text is dated, and apparently caused tremendous trauma in the city. It was restored quite spectacularly and acrobatically by shooting an arrow from the roof of Hagia Sophia and uh, doing a balancing act, act walk in order to put back, back the tufa. But uh, we have the 9th, 10th century moment here later on the 10th century, which shows how powerful this monument is as a triumphal statement of rulership. So this is one moment in restoration. The other moment in the restoration, you're looking at an English manuscript of the 15th century. And this, in fact, is Justinian on the horse, although the horse looks like a dog, but we will not judge the artist. But the interesting part here is the hand. You can see it's almost like a lobster claw hand of the horseman, and it's empty. And half the way through, you see a ball falling. That's the orb falling down. And the manuscript you're looking at here is the Mandeville, the travels of John uh, Mandeville. It's um, a literary creation, which was represented as an authentic text, became spectacularly popular in multiple uh, languages. But what this text refers to and registers is the restoration of the orb by Andronicus II. When the orb, uh, the Nikiforos Grigoras tells us it's the cross that fell, I can talk more about that it's most likely the orb that fell. Uh, the orb becomes a key point focus in restoration efforts in Paleologue and Constantinople to preserve that monument and to preserve imperial authority. So that becomes a very important associative point. The final point that I would like to make is that we have to move beyond our assumptions and engage the hierarchies of values with which Byzantine audiences endowed this monument. On the left, we're looking at the Byzantine illustrated manuscript where you can see the monument towering and breaking out um, over the boundaries of the image. On the right, we're looking at the legacy of Byzantium in Dukanj. Dukanj published, uh, of course, a fantastically important treatise on the history of the Byzantine Empire, and he chose an image of Constantinople. Uh, this is, of course, the Buon del Monte version, which does not have the horsemen, and which does not present the power of and statue of the uh, column of Justinian. And so, in many ways, this choice of a very important scholar, later on inspired the generations of Byzantinists to quite literally forget about the horsemen. So I would argue that restoring the horsemen to our imagined skyline of medieval Constantinople requires our rethinking of certain priorities um, 
narrative and visual, rethinking the evidence, and also rethinking Justinian in a way. What Justinian was to the Byzantine audiences throughout um, the Byzantine period, and how this monument was understood and the power it was endowed with. So I would urge us to go back to the sources and think further about how we shape our narratives and how often we should rethink sometimes at least our narratives. So thank you. Thank you.